In this video, I'm going to be sharing about hypervolemia and hypovolemia, the signs and symptoms, as well as the treatment. This information is important not only for the NCLEX exam, but also more importantly, for application in real life day-to-day -day nursing. Please watch to the end of this video where I will ask an NCLEX-like related question to give you NCLEX test practice, but also help reinforce some of this information. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Welcome to my nursing channel. My name is Nurse Master Charlie. Now our bodies are made up of approximately 50 to 60% of fluid, which includes water, blood, and some lymphatic fluid. We need the correct amount of fluids, not too much and not too little, to act as a transport system and to keep the organs of the body functioning properly, better known as perfusion. Let's first look at what and where are the body's fluid compartments. This is a little diagram of tissue showing the cells and the blood vessel. There is the intercellular space, which is within the cell, that is where the intracellular fluid, or ICF, goes. The extracellular fluid, or ECF, is found outside the cell and can either be in the tissue as interstitial fluid or in the vasculature as intravascular or plasma fluid. Fluid within these compartments is normally shifted and balanced within these compartments. Any deviation, whether due to illness, disease, and or medication, will result in fluid shifts, leading to hypervolemia or hypovolemia. So let's start with hypervolemia. If you examine the word hypervolemia, it will tell you what it means. It is a combination word. Hyper is defined as above normal, and volemia refers to blood volume, or more so to the volume of blood and fluid in the circulation. So hypervolemia would be defined as the above normal volume of fluid circulating in the body. Hypervolemia is also known as overhydration and or fluid overload, again being a condition where there is too much fluid volume in the body. There are three different types of overhydration. There is hypertonic overhydration, isotonic overhydration, and hypotonic overhydration. I know that one sounds a little weird. So let's briefly go over those specific types to help you better understand hypervolemia. First, the most rare type of overhydration is hypertonic overhydration. This is due to an excessive intake of sodium. Fluid is moved from the intercellular compartment, or inside the cell, and into the extracellular compartment, or outside the cell. Second. Isotonic overhydration. This is truly known as hypervolemia and causes circulatory overload and edema in the interstitial tissue, and this results from excessive fluid in the extracellular compartment or outside the cell that does not shift into the intracellular compartment or inside the cell. And thirdly, hypotonic overhydration, which is better known as water intoxication. This is where excessive fluid moves intracellularly or inside the cell while body fluid compartments then also expand with fluid, which leads to a dilutional effect. What all that means is hypervolemia is due to excessive fluid intake and or inadequate excretion of fluid or both. Now hypervolemia can affect anyone, but it can especially affect someone if a person has underlying conditions such as those with or caused by heart problems, specifically in the case of heart failure, renal or kidney issues as in decreased kidney function, or those in renal failure such as ESRD or end-stage renal disease, liver failure or cirrhosis, women who are pregnant, people with hormonal changes, people who consume too much sodium, aka excessive salt in their diet, excessive IV fluid, corticosteroid use, SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. These issues can lead to symptoms of difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. So what are the clinical presentations or findings that you will see? These can include neuromuscular findings, such as altered level of consciousness, headache, generalized muscle weakness, paresthesias, and visual changes. Cardiovascular findings can include bounding pulses, increased heart rate, tachycardia, distended neck veins, also known as JVD, which is short for jugular venous distension, increased blood pressure, or hypertension, elevated central venous pressure, or CVP, and cardiac dysrhythmias. Respiratory findings can include tachypnea, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, crackles or ronchus lung sounds, and decreased oxygenation or SpO2. Integumentary findings can include pitting edema, especially in dependent areas such as the ankles and feet, cool skin, pale skin, taut or tight skin, rapid increase in weight, specifically an increase in one to two pounds in a 24 hour period or three pounds in a week's time. This indicates that the patient is retaining fluid. Renal findings can include increased or decreased urine output depending on kidney function. Gastrointestinal findings can include diarrhea, hepatic enlargement, 
and abdominal enlargement or ascites. Some laboratory changes that can occur in hypervolemia include decreased urine-specific gravity. Now the normal range for urine-specific gravity is 1.005 to 1.030. Decreased serum sodium level, normal range for blood sodium levels is 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Decreased serum osmolality, normal ranges from 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. Decreased hematocrit, normal levels of hematocrit for men range from 41% to 50%. Normal levels for women is 36% to 48%. Decreased BUN, normal is 6 to 24 milligrams per deciliter. These levels are decreased and this occurs to the dilutional effects of excessive fluid. Let me verbally illustrate this with a cup of oatmeal and water. You have a cup of water and you have a cup of oatmeal and you mix the two, but you slowly add more water. The oatmeal becomes more diluted and watery. Same thing with blood and water in the body. The more fluid you add, the more diluted the blood will become. The goal of treatment is to restore the body's fluid balance. The treatment for hypervolemia can include oxygen therapy because the patient is experiencing shortness of breath, administration of medications such as diuretics, if kidney function is adequate. If not, then possibly hemodialysis. Restriction of sodium, restriction of fluids. Monitor INOs or intake and output of the patient. Monitor and treat electrolytes that may have been affected by the hypervolemia. Before I begin talking about hypovolemia, let's review the signs and symptoms of hypervolemia one more time. Just know that the symptoms of hypervolemia can range in severity from person to person. Rapid weight gain, one to two pounds in a 24 hour period. A headache edema or swollen arms, hands, and legs, dyspnea, shortness of breath or pulmonary edema, bloating in the stomach. Severe symptoms of hypervolemia requiring immediate treatment include heart failure, hypertension, and shortness of breath. Okay, now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, there is hypovolemia. So a quick review on the definition. Hypo refers to under or low, less or below normal. Volemia again refers to blood volume. Hypovolemia would be defined as being below the normal volume of fluid circulating in the body. It can also be called fluid volume deficit, fluid volume depletion, and dehydration. Just as there are three types of overhydration or hypervolemia, there are also three different types of hypovolemia, aka fluid volume deficit or dehydration. But in this case, there is not enough fluid to meet the metabolic needs of the body. There is hypertonic dehydration, isotonic dehydration, and hypotonic dehydration. So let's briefly go over those specific types to help better understand about hypovolemia. First, hypertonic dehydration. In this type, fluid is moved from the intracellular compartment or inside the cells and into the extracellular compartment or outside the cell, leading to cellular dehydration. This is due to changes in the concentration of plasma electrolytes, leading to water loss, which is greater than electrolyte loss. An example where this occurs is with diabetes insipidus. Secondly, isotonic dehydration. This is the most common type and is a true hypovolemia and results in a decreased amount of blood in the overall circulation. This leads to inadequate tissue perfusion. In this type, electrolytes and water are lost in proportional amounts. And thirdly, hypotonic dehydration, which is where cells begin to swell and fluid moves intracellularly inside the cell from the interstitial fluid spaces and the plasma. This leads to a plasma volume deficit. This is due to a greater loss of the concentration of plasma electrolytes than water loss. Hypovolemia can affect anyone, but it can especially affect a person if they have underlying conditions that cause loss of body fluid or blood, or is caused by internal bleeding, bleeding due to injury or trauma, persistent vomiting and diarrhea, excessive gastric suctioning, burn injuries, which is related to third spacing, wounds, hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating, diabetes or diabetes insipidus, malnutrition, dehydration or decreased intake of water, and diuretic use. Clinical presentation or findings can include neuromuscular findings, alter level of consciousness, generalized muscle weakness, and fever. Cardiovascular findings can include cardiac dysrhythmias, thready pulse, decreased peripheral pulses, increased capillary refill time, compensatory increased heart rate or tachycardia, and decreased blood pressure and hypotension, postural or orthostatic hypotension, and decreased central venous pressure or CVP. Respiratory findings can include tachypnea, dyspnea, and also increased depth of respirations. Integumentary findings can include dry mucous membranes, dry skin, and decreased turgor 
leading to tenting of the skin. Renal changes can occur such as decreased urine output. Gastrointestinal changes can include decreased body weight that is sudden, thirst, constipation, diminished bowel sounds, and decreased motility. Laboratory changes that you will find. I'll put the normal ranges on the screen, but in hypovolemia, there will be increased urine-specific gravity, increased serum sodium levels, increased serum osmolality, increased hematocrit, increased BUN. These occur to the decreased fluid, which makes everything more concentrated. That is why these levels are increased. Think of the cup of oatmeal and water again. You have a cup of water and a cup of oatmeal, and you mix the two. But now, in this case of, of hypovolemia, you slowly drain the water. The oatmeal becomes concentrated and thick. Same thing with the blood or water in the body. The more fluid you remove, the more concentrated the blood will become. Just as I reviewed hypervolemia, let's review the signs and symptoms of hypovolemia. But remember, these can range in severity for each person. These can include postural or orthostatic hypotension, leading to dizziness when standing dry mucous membranes, dry skin, feeling tired or fatigued or weak, muscle cramps, decreased urination, and dark colored urine. If hypovolemia is not corrected, it will lead to life-threatening hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is where there has been a severe fluid loss, blood or other, which is inadequate for the heart to pump enough blood into the circulation and for organ and tissue perfusion. Signs and symptoms can include confusion, losing consciousness, tachypnea, dyspnea, hypotension, urine output less than 30 milliliters per hour, cyanosis or pale skin, profuse sweating, and hypothermia. Treatment for hypovolemia includes providing fluid replacement via oral and or IV, monitoring intake and output, monitor and treat electrolyte imbalances, administer antiemetic and antidiarrheal medications if fluid losses were due to those conditions, possible basal pressors for hypotension after fluid is replaced. Provide safety, for example, fall precautions, such as dangling prior to standing. Okay, now let's put all that information into action. Here's the NCLEX like question. You as a nurse are assessing a patient admitted for COVID who is stable and will discharge later today. The patient tells you, I haven't urinated all day. In your assessment, you find tenting of the skin and dry mucous membranes and palpate a flat bladder area. Which nursing intervention should be included in the patient's plan of care? A, assess nasal discharge. B, administer diuretics as ordered, C, administer intravenous fluids per MD order and promote oral fluid intake, and D, continue to monitor the patient. I'll give you a couple of seconds. The correct answer is C. The patient is dehydrated and is in need of fluid. Now, if you learned a little something about hypervolemia and hypovolemia and found value in this video, please be sure to give this video a like. And if you are in, interested in health information and nursing related content like this, I'd like to invite you to subscribe and be part of my nursing channel. And also hit the notification bell so you can be made aware when I release new videos. Please be sure to check out my many other nursing topic related videos, as well as my nursing and health related educational music lyric videos here on YouTube. If you don't know, I write and create nursing and health related music. And if you want to take my nursing educational music on the go, my nursing songs are available for listening on almost all music streaming platforms such as Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, Pandora, etc. As well as here on YouTube. So until the next video, go save lives and make a difference in someone's life. God bless and goodbye. Thank you for watching.